This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today really doesn't need an introduction for those people that have happened to walk into a bookstore in the last 10 years. Jeffrey Gettemer, author of The Little Red Book of Selling, among many books. But his Little Red Book of Selling has sold 5 million copies plus, translated into 14 languages. Now look, I've sold a couple hundred thousand books. That's really good stuff. Most authors never touch that. Five million copies that Jeff has sold on one book? You've got to be kidding me. That's like all time stuff. That's just awesome. I'm not gonna give it away either too much here in the intro, but his little red book of selling really, really inspired me several years back. The risks that he was clearly taking as an author outside of the envelope of typical publishing. Jeff was taking a chance to do something different and he got rewarded for it. And damn it, if we can't learn from someone like that, we might as well retire and head on down to six feet under and just give up. But we are lucky, I am lucky, that I get to have these conversations with great minds. And this conversation with Jeff Gittermer is one of my favorite all-time conversations. It's easily in my top 10. Now, maybe I'm biased because I thought his book was so cool, but I don't think so. I think you're going to feel just like I feel right now, that Jeff brings a certain perspective, a certain view, a certain honesty that only comes with experience and success. Very humble, but very interesting. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Jeffrey Gidmer, because you know what? I sure did. In advance of this call, it jogged memories back for me because my first book came out in 04 and then another book in 07. You know, nowhere near your numbers, but for an author to sell 100,000 plus in the investment book space, okay, this is noteworthy. I started thinking about my third book and you know, I'm going through those bookstores and it's like every inspiration I had was like, I don't wanna do like everybody else is doing. I wanna do like this guy Gittimer. <laughs> That's who I want to do. I want to make a little red book of selling in the investment space. But let me tell you what happened. So it ended up becoming, your book really inspired me for my Trent Commandments book. But the thing that I really wanted to address with you and let you comment on it, let you run with it, through the publishing circles world, when I started asking about your book, the word that I got, and, and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong in my understanding, is that one of the initial reasons that that book had so much success was how you did it initially. My understanding is, is that you did everything in-house, basically had the book fully produced, and already had sold a lot of copies, and then went to a publisher for wider distribution. I did do everything in-house. The book actually took about a year longer to produce than... I thought it would because I wanted to put everything I had into it. The publisher, Bard Press, actually came up with the idea. We were sitting in a Mexican restaurant in Austin, Texas, and he said, you know, Harvey Pinnock put out that little red book of golf. I think you should write the little red book of selling. He sold a million and a half copies. You'll sell more. And I started on a napkin. I started to pen out some of the chapter titles. And chapter one is kick your own ass. And chapter 12.5 is resign your position as general manager of the universe. And I knew that I had to write something about networking, about asking questions, about humor. Literally, I, I halfway fleshed out the book at that restaurant. I came home and I started to write and then I got diverted and then I started to write and then I got diverted. But I hired a designer for typesetting. And that's one of the secrets of, of books. Publishers can't design worth a shit. So I charged the publisher for my design guy. 
they can't refute it because I've won awards for design and I've sold millions of copies of books as a result of it. So they end up doing it. Even Amazon on this, uh, the book we're going to talk about today, uh, Truthful Living, I designed this book. They didn't. And it was like a, it was almost a fist fight as to who was going to you know, do the design. I said, look, send me all the design awards you've won and then we'll talk about it. And <laughs> they didn't have any. That's funny, though, because here you've already got the street cred of five million plus for the Little Red Book of Selling. And I know Amazon is new to the ball game for, for being a publisher now a little bit. But why would they want to debate with you? You've kind of got a track record there. You know what? Let me tell you something, though. They may be new to the publishing game, but they're already number one. I have never in, in I've been doing this for 25 years. Amazon is head and shoulders above any other publisher slash printer slash book distributor I've ever seen. They have their shit together, totally. Well, that's a great, great tip for me that I will figure out how to execute on, trust me. <laughs> Let me put you in touch with my agent who has that inside connection. His name is from Literary Management, and he is the brightest guy in New York City in the publishing business. And he's the one that made this connection happen. Amazon is the future, period. Well, if, if you wanted to republish your book of Trend Commandments, what a great title, by the way. I bought it for the frickin' title. And then I, I perused the book inside. They, they have a, you can go inside of it pretty decent on Google. I looked at your chapter titles, and you think like I think. So I was excited. Listen, I'm not joking. That was literally... I sat, my publisher at the time was Pearson, Financial Times, Prentice Hall, all those names, and I was working with a guy named Jim Boyd, and I was literally having the conversation, I want to do something, like I kept saying your last name, like get Gittimer's done, that's what I want. And of course, I didn't, I didn't know your full process, so I was only able to get some aspects of the full creativity that you get, your full design, you know? Well, I can tell you this, the little red book of selling is now the best-selling sales book of all time. We were on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list for 103 straight weeks. Nobody will crack that one in the, in the sales field, even in the personal development field. It was an unbelievable process, but we invested in placement. We invested in airports. We invested in, in Barnes & Noble. But in those days, if your book made the list, all of the bookstores would put it face out in a special place. So it was always in the front of the store. You know, if you're number 12 on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list or number seven on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list, every freaking week, people pick the book up. And it, it's, Michael, it still sells. That does not surprise me at all. And you know, look, before we jump into your newest book here, The First Writings of Napoleon Hill, Truthful Living, I made a note to myself about the little red book. I just, I, I kind of jotted it down here in a, a highlighter, and I said to myself, who throws it away? Nobody throws that book away ever. Nobody. Here's what happens. People lend it to somebody else, and they never give it back. I get at least a dozen orders a week of somebody that says, I gave this to somebody. They never returned it. I need another copy. I mean, look, you've, you've been at this game for a long time. You've got a lot of experience, but you knew you must have had in your process, your thinking that as you were putting that together, you knew that you wanted to create not only would the textual content, the words, images, et cetera, resonate and you would deliver the goods that way, but you knew you wanted to have almost a piece of art that people, all the way from the little the little ribbon that hangs through the page reminder. I mean, you, you knew you wanted all of these details and you knew how critical that was gonna be. I'll share a secret with you. 10 years before, the Little Red Book was an idea. My friend and photographer, Mitchell Carney, here in Charlotte, gave me a book for Christmas called Paris Out of Hand, printed by Chronicle, I believe. And it looked exactly like the Little Red Book. And I said, one day, I'm going to have a book like this. It had an upside down graphic of the Eiffel Tower. I mean, it was just the coolest little book on the planet. When Ray Bard said the little red book, the first thing I thought of is, I know exactly what this book's going to look like. And I called Chronicle and they wouldn't give me the, the resource for the printing. 
<laughs> like seriously, five minutes later, I found out where it was printed and I called the lady back, gave her a slight expletive tirade about how sources are no longer secret. And then I gave her two more sources in China that I thought she could do a better job with the book next time. Let's point something out too for, the, for some out there that have not seen this book. The details go to the color, multicolor. I've not held the book in my hands for multiple years, so this is all on memory. It's multiple color, it's a heavier paper, it's glossy, it's got a beveled edge, I believe. It's got a kind of a cloth cover on the front. It's just every damn detail that one would want as an author. This is the, again, this is when I was trying to put my third book together. When I listen to you, I say the same thing. I'm like, you know, one day, I'm gonna pull off what you pulled off. You're creative enough. You've already created the, the, the concept, the titles. You know what you're doing. All you, I think what you need is a publisher and distribution. Even though it's a conversation between me and you right now, your Amazon tip is, is probably gonna be a tip that, uh, that a, a lot of people are gonna be like, you know, Mr. Amazon, please talk to me now too. <laughs> well, I'll give you my person, but I think it's only fair that you go through my, my agent because he's the one that set everything up. I can also tell you that Amazon has graciously provided me with an outside PR firm, and they're going fucking gangbusters. If you have the right book, they will back it. You know, if you go to a, a standard publisher today, they have their own, quote, marketing person who's usually a journalist graduate from a recent graduate from high school who's almost like an intern, and they will do four or five things for you, and that's it. This PR firm has already done... 30, including this interview with you, has already done 30 things for me, and we haven't even started because Amazon has hired them for six weeks after the launch. So that's October 30th through literally through the end of the year. You know, it's funny. Usually my podcast is something where it's, uh, I will go find people. Occasionally I'm connected. I'm friends with Ryan Holiday, and Ryan has graciously sent me some really nice guests over the years. But you're right. Your PR person reached out to me, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I've got this whole backstory with Jeff and I get a chance to talk to him. It helps to have a kind of a name and a kind of a reputation. I can tell you that. But what is happening right now with respect to this Napoleon Hill book is literally, it's scary to me. I'm holding your galley right now. So this is going to be a hard cover, I assume. Yes, it will be. But take a look inside the galley. Is the book autographed? It is. When is the last time you ever got a galley copy <laughs> from a publisher? You know the answer. <laughs> right. Uh, it's a two-word answer. Fucking never. <laughs> and the reason that I did it is that I'm sick of getting galley copies and hard copies from PR firms or from publishers and no one even signs their name to the letter. It's crazy. So I demanded at Amazon that they let me sign all the galley copies. They printed about a thousand of them. When I'm dead, you might want to go on eBay and get your money out of this one. As people are listening to you right now, though, on something simple sounding like signing a galley copy and people that don't know about galleys, these are the pre-release copies sent to people like me. You're, you're giving a lesson in sales right now, a very important one. It's called personalization so that the person feels connected before they even start to read. It, it becomes wow when they open up the page and they see that the author signed it and then someone else has to read it slightly more voraciously. I admit, I was very surprised. I, I, I've never seen it before. You've not sent me any kind of wire payment. I, look, I've, I've never seen a galley signed before, ever. You'll, the next one you see signed will be my next book with Amazon. Oh, and by the way, too, the galley that they sent me is basically essentially the same quality that you would see in most paperback editions or nicer of a finished book. Right. I refused to let them do it crappy. I hounded them to make sure that at least the galley copy would be something that someone would not throw away. And by signing it, it's definitely not been thrown away. And I'll tell you, I've had a dozen people proactively send me email for the galley copy thanking me. Well, you know, I got to tell you something really funny too. My girlfriend saw it and she's, you know, she started looking through a bunch of books that I had and she said, well, can I have this one? And I said, okay, you can, you can have it. That was before I read it. And then when I started reading it, I saw the signature inside. I was like, I'm thinking to myself, oh man, I really don't want to give it to her now. <laughs> exactly. 
we should shift into there because I could keep picking your mind about everything. And this is a really cool book. And the, the content is timeless, as, as you know. Let's set the stage here. I don't know if you saw the movie, but recently a movie came out called The Founder about Ray Kroc. And, and in that movie, he's listening to some old motivational tapes. This is set in the 40s and 50s. I don't think it's Napoleon Hill. I think it's, I think it's somebody else. But it's the same kind of headspace for me, for, the, for my audience. Give the mini bio on Napoleon Hill. When did you first come into contact with the name and his thinkings? In 1972, if anyone alive can remember back that far, my twin daughters were just born. I was in a marriage that was not going to last. I was pretty much broke and I had no direction. I joined a troop of guys who were in, at that time, multi-level marketing. And the leader of that troop was Glenn Turner in a company called Dare to Be Great. Five guys, me and four other guys, met every morning in a sales meeting for four hours, from eight until noon, every day for one year. In that meeting, we read, well, well we watched a movie called Challenge to America by Glenn Turner, we listened to The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale, and we did a book report on one chapter of Think and Grow Rich every day. Now, there's only 15 chapters in the book, so the book was, we would go through the book every month. And I read, I literally read from cover to cover that book 10 times in one year. And after about the third reading, I got a positive attitude. I, I can't explain what happened, but I can tell you exactly where I was at the time that I realized, oh, oh, I got it. And I was in New Jersey. People in New Jersey, that positive attitude, I think, is a jailable offense. You can't take it away from me now. And it's because of Napoleon Hill. He was the, the founding father in America of positive thinking and personal development, not just how you have to think positive and be positive, but what are all the elements in going into being a success? And this guy and, and this book in 1917 at the George Washington Institute in Chicago, he had a course on advertising and selling. But at the end of every lesson, he wrote his philosophy for succeeding and how and why and positive thinking and ambition and desire and all of the elements that go into it. After he passed away, the Napoleon Hill Foundation found these works 20 years before Think and Grow Rich came out. Now, Think and Grow Rich has sold 100 million copies. It's the benchmark book of, you know, the, the magnum opus of Napoleon Hill. But this writing from 1917 is the foundation of that. I'm reading this stuff. The Napoleon Hill Foundation, just a slight backstory, as a gratitude for my positive attitude, I was introduced to the Napoleon Hill Foundation by Charlie Tremendous Jones, who was my mentor in speaking. I volunteered to do the newsletter for the Napoleon Hill Foundation, Napoleon Hill Yesterday and Today. I've been publishing that for more than 10 years, gratis, just, for, uh, just as a thank you. Every Friday, it goes out to about 50 or 60,000 people. They came to me and said, hey, we found this stuff. Do you want to write or annotate you know, Hill's original writings? I'm like, hell yes, I do. That took two years. Like I went through every lesson, everything. I, I took away all of the sales part of it. And I just left the what's called after the lesson visits with Napoleon Hill. And I'm going to tell you, Michael, it is, it's absolutely unbelievable. My girlfriend was the editor, and as she's editing, she's texting me going, have you seen this one? Have you seen this quote? And she's like texting me quotes from the book. It's, it's very inspirational. Let me read one really quick. I'm going to try and read it quickly, but it's, it's a great one. It says, you may be wealthy for all I know. That isn't success. You may have a splendid education for all I know, but that isn't success either. You may have wealthy parents, but neither is that success. For you must remember that wealth, as measured in dollars and cents, is an evasive thing which sometimes takes wings and flies away. The only real permanent and worthwhile success is represented by the character you are building. And you know what? When you read that, you can't help but feel energized. Exactly. There are a hundred of those quotes in this book, 
plus all the information. As you as you peruse the book, you see the little uh, maroon full page quotes. We had to limit them. I, I had to literally go through and select those quotes that I thought would be most appropriate. I also have to tell you that I just finished recording the book. And because I didn't write it, and because it was written 100 years ago where lexicon was different, it literally took me 15 hours to record a book that would have normally taken me five. I had never practiced what I just read right there, and I agree with you. The lexicon is different. And as you read it, you're kind of, you have to kind of quickly do the mental gymnastics to get around it. Let me throw something just from the very beginning of the book, as long as you're reading a quote. He says, believe in what you are doing and in those who are helping you do it, and you are bound to win. In that quote, he's saying, hey, gather a bunch of people around that support you, believe in yourself, and now you have a team of people instead of just one person going for it. It guy's freaking brilliant. And th this is before the cars had paved roads. There was no airplanes. There was there was no uh, there was no anything. You know, no TV, no no computer, no nothing. You had a checking account. If you wanted to go someplace, you took a train. And he's sitting there espousing what's going to happen a hundred years from now, literally. And he was right. He predicted Amazon and Walmart. What's so nice about his work? is in a world right now where people are, you know, kind of got attention deficit disorder. They're jumping around to this headline and that headline. And what I love about the, the work that you've put together here is the breaking it down to the bare essence of thinking. And what I love also too, and this is from Napoleon Hill, this is his classic opener, thoughts are things. And, and that's very difficult, in my humble opinion, that's very difficult for initially at least 95% of the population, whatever population, to accept thoughts or things. It, the thoughts or things quote doesn't come until almost two thirds through the book. And when I saw it, my blood ran cold. Like, okay, here's the beginning of the process. And he's telling me, literally as a reader of his, early writings. Oh, I found it myself. I'm going to use this from now on forever. It's pretty cool. I mean, this book is historical as much as it is uh, challenging and inspirational. It lays it out. It tells you exactly what to do. He does it in a way where he doesn't say, you're a jackass if you don't do this. He's just saying, hey, this is what I do. He, he's <laughs> One of his quotes at the very early part of the book is, finish what you start. He clarifies it by saying, the time has come for you to succeed, but you cannot do it without finishing what you start. Like, dude, way to go. I think that there's a deep thinking behind this. This guy had to go home at night and marvel at the electric light, by the way, when he turned it on. That was one of, that's one of his things. He goes, wow, Thomas Edison invented this thing. Look, I can just flip the switch and the light comes on. We don't think about that today. We, we have LED lights that come from China that you turn them on and they're way better than any light has ever been before. But the bottom and they, they don't get hot and whatever the deal is. But it was a marvel back then. The phone was a marvel back then. The automobile was a marvel back then. The typewriter was a marvel back then. Think about all of the, of the elements that went into early part of the, our own industrial revolution. You know, the cash register was a big deal. Hill did this all in what we would refer to as primitive times, literally primitive times. Can you imagine a guy with no cell phone? When I read a sentence of his, and, and this is going across the work that you've put together here, there's no excuses. You read the sentence and it's almost like you've now got horse blinders on. If you jump off the sentence, you're making excuses. Like the sentences are so pure. If you leave it, you yourself know that you're doing the wrong thing. Very compelling. And I'll tell you, I got a much deeper understanding having edited the book and gone through the, the process, at least 10 reads of it before I ever turned it in and annotated it and put my own you know writings in there. But I, I didn't touch his. I left his words pure. But reading the book out loud, like I just did this past week, it's a whole new insight. I have a digital studio. I'm very fortunate. We, we have a really solid crew of people because we we're podcasting now five days a week and I record all kinds of my, all my YouTube videos. Everything's done in studio. 
my producer was going, wow, that's really cool. <laughs> and I was stopping going, do you realize what he just said? So the edits are, are boundless in this, in this piece. It was uber inspirational to do it. And it's made me a much bigger expert on the book, I can tell you that. Let me keep it at something that I just brought up a moment ago, where the notion of thoughts are things. I will really elaborate and kind of tear that apart, peel back the onion some, but also there's a sentence that I jotted down from the book, 95% of those out there, and this is not meant to be some kind of like, you know, ad hominem or something negative about people, but 95% of people really don't know how to think. It is an acquired skill. What he says in Thoughts Are Things, he's saying that everything that was ever invented and everything that you look at every day began as a thought before it ever materialized. He's telling the reader that if you're not thinking of something new, you're never gonna do anything new. You don't just wake up and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something cool. No, it started in your mind and manifests itself. Maybe you thought about it, then you sort of jotted it down, and then a week later you came back and edited, but you're still thinking, your mind is still going through that thought process. Every one of your listeners right now You've been in the shower or you've just gone for a run and all of a sudden a thought pops in your mind, mostly because your mind was clear, but that thought will vanish if you don't write it down immediately. And it is the beginning, it's that, that the seed of whatever it is that you're trying to plant. By writing it down, you're starting to water it. You've planted it, you've started to water it, but it began as a thought. And when he says thoughts are things, he's saying all of these things began as a thought, then someone did something about it and it manifests itself as a light bulb or an automobile or a telephone or an airplane. That's the process. You know, the Wright brothers thought about flying in Dayton, Ohio, but didn't take off until they got the Kitty Hawk. That's what he's saying there. And it's so freaking deep and so freaking brilliant that you pass it by. It's three words and you're right, it's so deep, but it's three words. What he says all along in the book is everything that you touch or do or feel or wear started as a thought. That's the process by which he is sticking to as a, an underlying theme throughout the entire book. Think about it. Think about it. Those three critical words, what they do in my mind is they transmit to the individual, you have power. It's now on you. Your thoughts are things you as the individual have immense power, but you probably just don't yet know it. That is totally correct. And most people overlook their own power because they're too busy watching television like a fool. But I, let, let me throw something at you. He talks about these elements, these five basic elements of enthusiasm, self-confidence, concentration, and imagination and desire. And what he's saying, all of that is thought. All of it is thought. Th think about imagination, desire, enthusiasm, self-confidence, and concentration. They're all thought. He's telling you, dude, get into your own head. You're going to start to succeed. Until you do, you're working for somebody else, getting to work on time at 9 o'clock in the morning, and you're going to do jack shit. You know why I love this podcast, Jeff? Because there's nowhere else that I know of that I could have turned on any TV show in the United States of America in the last year to hear what you're saying. Thanks, thank you very much, Michael. I mean, I'm serious. I mean, that can sound flattering, but I'm saying it is an objective fact too. Because if I turn on any news show, if I turn on something else, it's all about everything else that's not important. Blame and bullshit. That those are the two things that you get when you turn on the television and you're watching any kind of something that someone else considers factual. It's somebody else's opinion of what happened. Well, what's great too is about your work, and we're such in a divided world these days. There's these different tribal factions. There's nothing tribal about the works of Napoleon Hill. If somebody can find something tribal in here, I think they need to go see a, a doctor for some type of a, a mind checkup. He doesn't care who you are. He doesn't even care if you're a criminal. He's telling you that if you change the way you think about yourself and you focus on what's important to you as a person, you can turn any failure into a success. And you can take your failures and turn them into lessons. That's the main thing. That you know, people get all upset and they, they start slamming doors. Like, dude, sit down, write what happened, 
figure out what you need to do so that it doesn't happen again, and then do that. And he does it in such a compelling way that you can't help but want to try it. And that's the whole deal. Once, once you start to play with Napoleon Hill's words and you start to put them into your own life, it changes everything. You know, 1972, think about that. That's a long time ago. Uh, my, my twins are 46 years old, so I know exactly what it is. If you can carry around a positive attitude for 46 years, you begin to develop it. I also wrote the little gold book of Yes Attitude based on the fact that I wanted to put my own attitudinal thoughts into writing. And that book, it's 10 years old. I just came out with a, a new edition after the 10th. It sold more than 300,000 copies in, in America. It'll sell a million copies. There's no doubt in my mind. You know, Amazon will pair it with the Napoleon Hill book, and all of a sudden it'll make a bestseller list someplace. It's totally crazy what Amazon can do. Let me go back in time a little bit here, because as people hear some of the sales numbers, they're probably thinking, well, my gosh, you know, Jeff must, he must have the uh, literary uh, pedigree. He came from the finest schools, the best grades, and all that kind of stuff, right? That's exactly true, right? I'm a product of my parents who were intelligent. So I was born with the gift of intelligence. And then I had to decide what I was going to do with it. Well, I sort of pissed it away at school. I went to Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I could have dropped out of any school, but I chose to drop out of Temple. And I traveled in Europe for one year at the age of 20. When I landed on the plane, I realized that I knew everything. You know, I'm just going to go around and I'll be Mr. King shit. When I actually got out of the plane and walked around some of the cities, I didn't know anything. I mean, I had no concept of history. I had no concept of what happened on the continent in the Second World War. Went to a concentration camp museum at Dachau, read the diary of Anne Frank on her doorstep, studied everybody that I possibly could in, in, from, from Vienna to, to Stockholm. And... I got an idea of what I had to do. I had to learn something new every day. And you can't learn something unless you admit that you don't know it. Did you go solo to Europe? Yeah, I went by myself. How important was the by yourself part of it? It was all important. You don't go with any, when you're going to make a trip like that, that's your life's journey. From that trip, I got wanderlust. I was staying at a hotel in Paris and the lady was a lovely you know, nice Jewish lady who took a liking to me and said, look, you can keep your bags here and take a train any place and then come back here and your bags will still be here. I'm like, cool. And so I used Paris as a sort of a jumping off point to travel around the continent. And I went everywhere. I mean, literally, I went to every major city on the continent, ended up falling in love with a girl in Berlin, ended up skiing in Switzerland for a while. I mean, it was all, all kinds of things happened. I got hit by a car in Copenhagen and the guy that hit me took me to the hospital. And all, all kinds of stuff happened. And by the way, they don't call it Danish pastry in Copenhagen because you're already in Denmark. They just call it pastry. <laughs> the, the challenge that you have when you're on a trip like that is you wake up every morning and it's a new adventure. I, I'd never been to any of these places before. So every time I got to turn a brand new corner and you meet somebody on the train. I took a German course in Berlin to, to learn how to speak German. One of the kids in my class, and this is 50 years ago, follows me on Instagram. Now think about that. <laughs> it's mind boggling. Let me share something with you really quick. I don't recall his name off the, off the top of my head. The founder of Fiji Water came from a wealthy family. His father told him, same kind of age, early 20s, he said, look, I'm gonna give you a choice. I'll give you some money to start a business or I'll give you money to travel the world. However, if you choose the money to travel the world and I find out that you travel with anyone, the deal's off and you get nothing. Oh yeah, that's great. I think it's more difficult for a woman to travel alone these days, but not impossible. If you understand the rules, I have a nine-year-old daughter, even though I shouldn't, I do. Um, I have a nine-year-old daughter. She's been to Paris eight or nine times. I've lost count. She will know how to travel by herself safely because I'm letting her now take little walks and you know go places that she wouldn't dare. I, I take, I have, all of my granddaughters are older than my youngest daughter. So this 
summer, we took my 16 year old granddaughter and they went out together for walks. They did it. You know, when you're nine and you can be semi alone in Paris without a parent, you're going to be okay. You know, knowing how to take the elevator or knowing how to take the, the escalator or knowing, knowing where you live and knowing the code for the front door or how to use your metro ticket. That's the deal. One of the ones that I want to let you elaborate on, I feel very attached to this. I, I run my life this way in many ways. Of course, look, I'm a capitalist. I like to make money. I like to have some success. I've got a little bit of ambition, all that kind of fun stuff. But the principle of service is ultimately the foundation of, of where I have found any success because ultimately there's been so many people ahead of me that have given back to me and I've kind of given back to them. And so I've just found that this notion, and, and, and Napoleon Hill probably outlines it better than, than my own thoughts, of course, but the principle of service, so key, isn't it? It's totally key. There's a 5,000 year old ancient Chinese proverb that says to serve is to rule. And you bring it into the 21st century and you see all the companies that serve the best end up winning. You can say anything you want about Amazon, but their service rules. You can say anything you want about Nordstrom or Southwest Airlines, their service rules. They live by their service philosophy. I have taken that. I, I've taken it in a slightly different direction, Michael. Part of my philosophy is I give value first which basically is a service principle. I'm looking to do something for the other person and something in a way that becomes memorable and they are either grateful for it or whether they acknowledge it or not, I didn't do it for them. I did it for me. I perform one random act of kindness every day, no matter what. And I do that. The other person feels good, but I feel way better. People don't realize that service comes from your heart, not from your head. You don't have not like an obligation to do it, although we have a kind of a disdain for it in this country. But when you when you serve, it comes from your heart. And that's the principle. Hill is what Hill is saying is you feel great when you serve other people. And literally it leads you to success because even though that person may not pay you back, the world will pay you back because you are servant. That's the principle that you have to live by. It does. It just makes you feel good, doesn't it? Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Even if it's just holding a door for a, an older person or um, helping somebody up if they've fallen down, just something that makes you feel okay. It's amazing what it does. And I'm on a mission to do one a day, no matter what. Sometimes it's leaving a bigger tip. Sometimes it's opening up a car door, whatever it is. It makes you feel good. I don't recall ever, because I, I got the little red book of selling. That was the first book of yours that I've ever seen. I don't recall ever going, once I had the book, I didn't need a review. I made my own judgment and didn't really care what anyone said. I'm curious, though, for a guy like yourself who's so prolific, uh, multiple books, millions of sales, and I'm sure if I went to Amazon, I guess I could find criticism there. I've never read it, so I don't know what people say. But I'm curious your general view on criticism as a whole. What, what do you even think of when you think of the word criticism? Does it even something that you even ponder at all? Or I'll throw this at you. When the Eiffel Tower was built in the early 1900s, 300 prominent French people, the leaders of the country, wanted it torn down the day after the exposition was over because they called it the ugliest building on the planet, the ugliest edifice on the planet. Guy de, they didn't tear it down. People were still angry about it. Guy de Maupassant, who was one of the biggest critics, ate lunch at the Eiffel Tower every day for the rest of his life because it was the only place that he could be in Paris and not see the Eiffel Tower. But in 1600, some... Finland guy said, no statue was ever erected to a critic, but the people that they've criticized, many statues have gone up. And if you go to the Eiffel Tower, you'll see a statue of Gustav Eiffel that's absolutely gorgeous, but you will not see a statue of any of his critics. Think about it that way. 
Same with the guy that built the Brooklyn Bridge. Same. You, it, you look at anybody, you know, they'll criticize Elon Musk or they'll criticize Jeff Bezos or Steve Jobs. Dude, those are the founding fathers of their respective business. They're going to march forward. They don't give a shit what anybody says about them. You know, they get to wake up and if somebody criticizes me, this is my philosophy about it. I get to wake up in the morning and be me. They have to wake up in the morning and be them. And I'm happy with who I am. I'm looking at one of my notes here as you're talking and I'm feeling it. And what I'm feeling inside this Napoleon Hill book that you've put together, ambition is a contagious thing. I'm already an ambitious guy, but I can literally feel you across the lines and I can feel more ambition and it feels contagious to me. Attitude, enthusiasm, any kind of passion is contagious. You get it from the other person if you feel it from them. We will be inspired all day long based on this interview, maybe all week long. I won't be able to sleep early, that's for sure. Hey, l listen, I, I, you've got about a little, little over 20 years on me around, but I'm curious, for people that are listening right now, you've got more energy in your voice than most uh, lethargic folks that I meet in their 20s. And I'm not, look, there's plenty of folks in, the, in their 20s in Silicon Valley that are tearing it up. So I don't want to generalize there. But what have you done differently? What have you learned about the aging process and attitude that's different? Why are you not slowing down at all? There's a real easy sentence that I can give you. I love what I do. And if you love what you do, if you're passionate about what you do, then every day is a great day. I don't have two days alike. I don't have two speeches alike. I don't have two books alike. The, the challenge that I have for myself is I don't have enough time in the day. I think sleeping is the biggest waste of time of my life. So I try to do it. And people say, well, you got to have eight hours. I got to have six hours. I, I don't even want those if I can help it. But the, the challenge that I have is I have a passion for what I do and I have an idea for what is next. What is next is the most important thing in life, because if you live in the past or you dwell in the past, you're never going to get to the to the present or the future. You can learn from the past, but you can't live there. So I live in the moment, but I'm ready for tomorrow and I'm ready in a way that my ideas are there and my philosophy is there, and my strategies are there, and my connections are there. Just look at the friendship we've built in an hour. You meet people, and I'm, I'm sure you could say the same thing back to me, older people than you that you met along your career, and we all become older at some point in time. I mean, my gosh, I don't know how I got to be my age. It just happened like that. But you know, I, I just want to be inspired. Every person in my life, I just want to be inspired. And look, I'm, I'm old enough now to where I, I enjoy, if I can, if I can give inspiration to somebody who is hungry for it too, I will. I look, there's a friend of mine and she is, uh, she's Vietnamese and she has found a way to get herself down to uh, grad school in Australia. And I was texting with her, listening to some of her story. And I actually sent her a few screenshots from this book. And she was just so excited to get the positive feedback. You know, it was just, and so I, I love that kind of stuff, just like you do. I will tell you that more than 20 years ago, I was at a networking event in Charlotte. I'm a huge wrestling fan, professional wrestling. You know, the guys that sort of fake it. Don't tell me you know Ric Flair. I do know Ric Flair. <laughs> I, I, I hate you. <laughs> but uh, somebody came up to me and said, hey, I know you're a wrestling fan. Nikita Koloff, the Russian nightmare, is, is here. Would you like to meet him? And I go, sure. And he, Nikita was a bad guy. He comes up and he's this you know, big hunk of a guy. Uh, Jeffrey Gitterman, he shakes my hand. He goes, oh, it's nice to meet you. And I looked at him. I said, I've hated your fucking guts for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, well, I guess I was doing my job. We actually became friends so friendly that we, he's now my house guest at least once a month for about a week because he lives out West and he travels back East. He stays with us. He's like my brother. I'm honored to have him as a friend because now he's a minister. He saved all his money. He's, you know, financially independent and he goes around and preaches and helps other people. One of the key principles of our life together as friends is our passage from the Bible that we both discovered from one another. I asked him one day, I said, what's your favorite passage? 
And he goes, well, it's from Matthew. It's an O ye of little faith. And I took my Bible out and I showed it to him that I had it underlined. <laughs> Those kind of things. And think about it because Napoleon Hill writes about faith. I talk about how you believe in yourself. But, you know, it was the boat ride where Jesus calmed the waters. It's just a phenomenal understanding of, dude, if you don't believe, you're going no place, whether it's religion or business or the business of religion. But the bottom line is I developed a friendship with somebody because we felt we had a common bond. And then all of a sudden, literally 20 years later, we figured it out. If we took the little red book of selling and did a separate hour long episode of literally connecting the little red book of selling to professional wrestling and how they get so much of it right. My gosh, how much color could we add there for the last 30 years, huh? Nikita and I wrote a book called Wrestling with Success. And he talks about his, his uh, year long battle with Ric Flair. I think he wrestled Ric Flair about 400 times in one year. But you know, they, the outcomes are predetermined. It's, it's not fixed. The outcomes are predetermined. Those guys are ready. They are prepared. They are absolute specimens with 8% fat. It's unbelievable who they are is it? and what they're capable of doing in a, in a rink. And a lot of the guys have been to my home. A lot of the wrestlers, they're great guys. They're fun guys. I, I've just been really blessed in that, in that I got to sort of meet my heroes. Because I used to take all my kids to the wrestling matches. It was funny as hell. I remember watching probably in the guests, uh, gosh, late 70s, early 80s was when I first started watching. It was mostly Vince McMahon stuff back then. So I didn't I didn't really come into contact with uh, Flair until later on. But some of those old YouTube clips where you can go find Flair, where he's on fire, you find him on fire and you're just like, you just say, my gosh, this is the most amazing performer to watch him talk to the announcer. You can't stop watching. Exactly. He was, he was as prolific as anybody in terms of patter. You know, he knew what to say and he knew how to say it. If you ever really watch deeply, Dusty Rhodes, the guy who was the called the American dream, he was the brains behind all of those storylines. Like who would beat up who and how, how that would evolve and who would get to the championship matches. And then Vince McMahon started his own thing. Dusty had one of the worst wrestling bodies ever. He was really just... <laughs> oh, yeah. I want to end with something. Because the listeners to you are looking for something that they can take away and they can take back to their office or they can take back to their home and potentially turn it into money. In the book, um, literally, it's on page 206, there's a quote. It begins with the, the, the chapter, the five point rule. Napoleon Hill says, success may be had by those who are willing to pay the price. And the price is eternal vigilance in the development of self-confidence, enthusiasm, working with the chief aim, performing more service than you are paid for, and concentration. With these qualities well-developed, you will be sure to succeed. Now think about that. This is written 100 years ago, and there's not one word in there that has timed out. It'll be valid 100 years from now. Not only are they not timed out, but every word is needed and there's not any extra that's not needed. Exactly. There's no adverbs or adjectives in there that you can say, well, you could edit this out. I didn't want to edit anything in this book. I wanted people to see Napoleon Hill's real words. I took away some of parts of the lessons, but I did not edit one word of his in personal development or in positive attitude or even in selling. There was no reason for me to do it. I'm not you know, who the hell am I to take away somebody's word? Either fortunately or unfortunately, it was written in the mail because in 1917, women were housewives or, you know, they, they didn't, they weren't in the working world the same way they are right now. So you have to interpret some of the things as men or women. But the bottom line is this stuff is unbelievable. I would implore anybody just to go out and read the book twice. You can't read it once. Read the book twice and it's life changing. I want to give a a reason why I think people should check it out. Something that I love to do with Google is a lot of the out of print books, and I've gone back 
100, 200, 300 years to look for investment books, right? And you've got in the rear of this, in the appendix, it says books you ought to read. These are Hill's original recommended readings from 1919. I'm not gonna name them, but I have, a, and I haven't done this yet, but I have a sneaky suspicion that I can go on to Google's ancient books and probably find these. That alone, to go down the dusty trail of figuring out Hill's influences is a really cool exercise. Yeah, many of the books are available, many are not. I, ha I actually, I have them all, and I'm going to be taking my library and letting people subscribe to my library. I'm going to scan everything and, and put it into a Kindle type of, of documentation. And for 10 bucks a month, you can come into my library and peruse anything you want. You can't download it. You'll be able to read it, but you'll be able to make notes in it, and you'll be able to talk to other people about it. But all of these books will be will at some point be in my library that people can go in and, and become a member. The book, The First Writings of Napoleon Hill, Truthful Living. What a great title, right? What did, you know, I should ask you before I let you go. I, I, I got to keep you for an extra minute. What does truthful living mean to you exactly? What it means is that you are true to yourself and that you honor yourself as a person and that you go through your life waking up in the morning going, okay, I did it yesterday. I can do it today and I'm going to do it tomorrow. You're telling yourself the truth so you can tell others the truth. It's how to live your life. It's not just how to make a sale or, you know, it's how to be a better dad. It's how to be a better person. You, I, I have always stated that you can't be a great dad for other people until you're a great person for yourself. Then you have the opportunity to be a great dad. But you, it's, this is, life is not a sacrifice. Life is continual learning. And then you help, not sacrifice. You, or you serve, not sacrifice. That basically, that's the, the essence behind the title. Jeffrey, I hope I can convince you to come on and chat with me as future books arrive in the next 30 to 40 years of your existence. I, I thoroughly enjoy chatting with you. You bring the power, you bring the energy, you wake me up. I'm going to go run around the block now or something. Uh, <laughs> oh, cool. What the hell time is it where you are? Uh, it is, it's only 8 o'clock. It's not bad. Oh, it's not too bad. No, it's not too bad. Where can we send people? Where's the best website? I know where it is, but where's the best place we can send people? Amazon for my book, For Truthful Living. Go to Gittimer.com, G-I-T-O-M-E-R.com for anything else. Um, my website's pretty complete now, and it's responsive. You can get it on your phone. You can get it on your tablet. You can get it on your laptop. There's a wealth of material there. When you buy Truthful Living, there's going to be an awful lot of other stuff about it. There'll be a Facebook group. There'll be all kinds of things. When the, After the book launches, there'll be places where you can go and discuss it because it will be discussable. I can promise you that. Uh, the Napoleon Hill Foundation has authorized and endorsed the book. I think there's a YouTube video up right now by Don Green endorsing the book. I'll be at the Frankfurt Book Fair in Frankfurt, Germany, talking about getting it done in other languages. I want, I want this book in 40 languages in one year, and I'll, I'm going to make it happen. I'm not betting against you. No, no, no. It'll be in Vietnamese, by the way. <laughs> I've seen many of the motivational titles here. I, the biggest names I've seen have been probably Kiyosaki and uh, Anthony Robbins, there's a, a ravenous appetite for these types of work, for sure. As we were just talking about Nikita, he sends out a daily inspirational quote. For some reason today, uh, it just came across my screen as we're ending. It says, the secret to personal change is to know and face the truth. You can't be more, it can't be more realistic than that. I'm a full believer in if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said because it will always come out exactly the same way again. It's very difficult in today's world to understand that that's the basis of communication. Because if you tell one mistruth, no one trusts you again, ever. Look at any politician. They're untrustworthy people because they're, they're all about self-aggrandizement and blame. They're not needed for our personal success, our personal happiness. They're not relevant. Exactly, other than how much of our tax money we can keep. That becomes an issue, but I don't, I don't know if we've got really much of a say in that really either. So. No, but hey, uh, it's pleasure meeting you, pleasure getting to know you, and I certainly wish you every success in your endeavors. I will read, um, even though I'm not a trader, I will read Trend Commandments because the title is freaking compelling.
<laughs> Thank you, sir. I, I really like your ideas about working with Amazon. For a fellow author, that's very inspirational and very insightful, to say the least. Cool. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i hook you up with, with and you can sort of take it from there. Jeffrey, thank you for your time today. Michael, it's a total pleasure. My people will call your people again and we'll, we'll play again. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Take care, Michael. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.